listen to this record I just found, you know, like that. So he makes it a cup of tea and he puts his record on. I said, well, what is it? He said, it's Captain Beefheart. Is it, this album is amazing. And he went on raving about it, like that. It's counterpunctual, it's polluted, make it this, all those kind of things that we love to talk about, right? Counter cut. <laughs> polluted, make counter melodic, etc. And about 20 minutes into this thing, I'm beginning to see the walls move. <laughs> I said, wait a minute, I'm looking at my hand, I see the veins flowing with blood in my hand. <laughs> and, and, oh dear, this is weird. And he had, a, he had a gramophone, as we used to call it now, that had one of those things that you put more than one album on it and it would drop, book. And the thing would go, <laughs> da, 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 da. But he, he had this one record on, and when the needle got to the end, he came out to my door and started it over again. <laughs> and he went on. This thing is like this. Between looking at the walls moving and hearing this music, I'm saying, this is a very strange experience. What the hell is going on? Then I looked at him, and he's on a couch, and he's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. <laughs> I said, hey, Peter, what are you trying to do? I'm trying to be a cell. <laughs> wow, there's a man whose musical judge might trust, telling me he wants to be a cell. <laughs> Who is this from the record player? Well, can't you put another record on? I mean, this thing has been going for two hours. Man, that's the safest milk. Don't you know? That can be far. Oh, that's the guy who was telling me how to speak. He said, you should listen to him. But has he done anything else? I said, no. That's his first album. Let me be a salad, let me be a salad. <laughs> And like he's coming on here, he really got smaller and smaller and smaller. I said, okay, he's lost, I can't converse with him, let me just listen to this thing. And I listened to side A for about three hours and side B for about three hours. By this time it was like eight o'clock in the morning, I look out the window and the snow is still falling and my car is covered in snow and my, my, my girlfriend is calling the police because they didn't get home and my God knows what. I heard Captain Beefheart for six hours straight. <laughs> and when he came, that was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. When he finally made to uh, Peter wanted to manage him, I was kind of helping him, because Peter, when he was enthusiastic about something, he wanted the whole world to know. And I had a public relation company at the time, and I said, I'll help you. So I met Don. And we sat down, and we talked about what were his ideas were, what should he be doing. And the way he was talking, I figured out that the, the statement that somebody made that he chose the word beef art was because he had a beef in his heart about society. Was right. He did have a beef about society. And I figured out that that was America. Because when we came to America in the first time around about 63, 64, we had a beef with this country too. We, we, we had tremendous kind of disappointments here. We found out that everybody thought the Rolling Stones invented blues. Nobody knew about Wendy Waters. Nobody knew about all the people that we worshipped and admired. And uh, I said, what's going on here? The people are misinformed. They're, they don't connect the dots. And we found that it's very much a characteristic of American society or the empowerment, the establishment of American society does not want to allow you to connect the dots. So it separates you to put, put you in little boxes here. Urban, adult, contemporary. I wonder what would what would say? How would B fart be defined now? Any ideas? Huh? Other. Other. That's easy. That's easy. Easy listening. Well there you go. Easy listening. Elevator music? Easy. Dance music? Or what? It's so difficult to use words to describe music. Right. Anyway, when I met him, I, 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 he, was, he had a few kind of complaints about how his career was going. And, and I, I had stood him really well. Later on, when I was here in New York, I met him here. He had this amazing guy. When I did the Urban Plaza and the Mud Club the same night, I don't know anybody in New York who had the courage to do that. He did Urban Plaza at like 10 o'clock and the Mud Club at 2 in the morning. Didn't even change in between. 
<laughs> so in London we were talking and I thought, Jeepers, I think the best help I could give him is to convince him to stay in Europe for a while. Then yeah. stay here for two, three months, you know, have a look around, we'll figure out something, we'll get, get a, you know, we'll get your house to stay in somewhere. But he was so attached, he was so attached to the desire to make it in America, in his own country, to become a rock and roll star. Don, you're out of your mind. <laughs> rock and roll stars are like 18, undernourished, uh, thin, uh, long-haired, uh, muscles people. You are a statuesque presence. You, you, you know, there's things going on in your brain. I said, yeah, yeah, and yeah, he had this kind of summer on it. I said, conditioned by Western Europe, conditioned by the cultural uh, uh, determinists and the, the uh, hierarchy of power in America. He, he was trying so badly to be a success here. You know? And there's no way that I thought that he would ever make it because this country was not prepared for people like him. This country wasn't prepared. For Charlie Parker. This country wasn't prepared for John Coltrane. This country wasn't prepared for Don Cherry, for uh, a whole bunch of people. This country wasn't prepared. In Europe, we just worship these people. We put them in symphony halls and say, play to your heart sometimes. Pay them well. You know, the Folk Foods Festival tour we did for 10 years every year in concert halls. And Jagger and company were sitting in the first row like this. Matthew Walker. You know what you So I thought that he would probably find many difficulties if he wanted to achieve his dream as a rock star in America. And then there was this relationship with Zappa. I won't bore you with details because I knew the Mothers of Invention were the first band that I ever saw in Los Angeles. When I, came, when I got there with the Yardbirds in 1964, or 65, it was the first American band I ever saw there. And I was knocked out. And there were 10 people in the room. <laughs> Henry Ristine was still playing guitar with his shoes unlaced, this tall guy, Henry Ristine. And, and, and I fell in love with the Mothers of Invention. And so I, I got to know it was Frank and his manager, his name escapes me. And, 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 and later on, I, I found Frank and, 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 and I got to, and, Don had gone to the same school. Terrence McCann and Judy Garland went there too. <laughs> Some valley, and made a high school. Or something. And I said, well, this is not going to work either. So when Don came to Europe under the EGs of Frank's record label, he still had the same complaints he had three years before about Warner Brothers or whoever he was assigned to. And I said, oh man, you know, if you don't. <laughs> make certain moves, you're going to be caught in this conundrum. And I'm very, very, very sorry that I managed to convince him to stay in London for a few months, or perhaps even a few years, or become a, a European artist. Because you know? there's no way of missing out on where his music came from, and where his, his kind of entire spirit came from, which I thought came from the Delta, the Mississippi, I'd say. But he also listened to a whole other a lot of stuff. And that proves that the generosity of a, of a great artist, he can look at other people's work and not be afraid to be influenced by it. We can steal here and there a few ideas, but not to be afraid. When musicians to me, I ask them, what do you listen to these days? They say, oh, I don't listen to anything. I say, well, why? I don't want to be influenced. <laughs> so, so I think there's not that many ideas going on in your mind when you're afraid of being influenced. Captain B. Fark was not afraid to be influenced. And you listen to his music and you see the courage there is in that music. You know, and courage leads to honesty or, or the other way around. Honesty leads to courage. If, if you're trying to scam people, you can never be sufficiently forceful in uh, uh, establishing whether you're honest or not. But someone who's very honest and has to do what they have to do uh, is very convincing, in my opinion. And Captain B. Frank was, is one, even today, one of the most convincing artists that I've known in my life. Thank you.